So what we do when we see a patient is we first try to determine what is their risk. So every patient that we see, we want to look at their risk. And we look at certain factors that have been proven to correlate with increasing risk. And there are factors that we have known for 10, 20, 30 years that have correlated very well. And there's what we call emerging factors, the factors that we're still studying to look at risk. Here's some of the established factors. We know as you get older, you have an increased risk of having heart disease. So age is one of the things. We know, unfortunately, that males have heart disease at a younger age than men. And so we look at them uh, even closer at younger ages. Genetics dr uh, drives it, so we look at your family history. We ask you what your parents died from, brothers and sisters, what type of disease runs in the family. And then if you have diabetes, if you're overweight or obese, if you have high blood pressure, if you smoke cigarettes, if you're a couch potato or not, if you have physical inactivity, or if you have a diet that's high in um, fats and high in cholesterol, in addition to looking at your LDL, bad cholesterols, HDLs, good cholesterols. And then there's some emerging factors that we can look at also. Different inflammatory markers, different markers that cause blood clotting, um, different markers that uh, are emerging to look at uh, further ep episodes of risk. We also look at a couple of other things. We know that certain diseases act as if you've already had heart disease. And diabetes is one of them. So we talked about counting risk factors. But if you already are diabetic, we consider you as already having heart disease. And that's because studies have shown that 80% uh, of diabetics die because of cardiovascular disease, either having a heart attack or a stroke or, one or, the, or other types of atherosclerotic disease. 75% of all the diabetics go into the hospital, go in the hospital not because of their diabetes per se, it's because of some problem with uh, their, their heart uh, or blood vessels. And over 50% of diabetics, when they are diagnosed with diabetes, already have clinically evident heart disease. So we consider diabetes a coronary heart disease risk equivalent. If you've got diabetes, you have just the same risk as if you've already been diagnosed with having heart disease. And so diabetes are in that group that has coronary heart disease risk equivalent. The second group that we look at are patients who have known cholesterol in other parts of their body. So if a patient comes to the hospital with a small stroke, and we find that they have some cholesterol in one of their arteries in their neck, we know that they're at increase of having another stroke, but we also know that they're at a high increased risk of having a heart attack. Because if you've got cholesterol building up in one artery in your body, it's likely going to build up in other arteries in your body as well. And then what we do is we look at the whole patient and we try to look to see if these risk factors are clustering in an individual. What we have found is that most people don't have one risk factor. If somebody has one risk factor for heart disease, they usually have two or three. They tend to cluster together. We've actually developed a new syndrome that is just a way to easily identify patients with this um, uh, clustering of risk factors. We call it the metabolic syndrome. These are individuals who have too many risk factors clustered together that lead to heart disease. And what seems to be driving this syndrome in this country is the obesity epidemic in this country. And as individuals are gaining more and more weight, especially that weight in the middle portion of their body, it leads to abnormal metabolism that leads to um, abnormal cholesterol profiles, abnormal blood pressure, and leads to heart disease. And so we've got criteria that we use. We look to see how much uh, extra fat is in the middle portion of the body, so we measure waist circumferences. We measure a number of different fats in the blood, the triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, the so-called good cholesterol, measure blood pressure, and measure fasting sugar levels. And the more of these that you have that are abnormal, the higher likelihood in your lifetime that you're going to develop heart disease and develop diabetes. So typically what we do is we look at a patient. We measure some of these factors. Some of it is just by doing a careful physical exam. And some of it is just doing some very simple blood testing. Some of it can be done with a sim single uh, finger stick where we can measure a glucose or we can measure cholesterol, some an actual uh, blood draw. And then we put them all together into a formula to calculate what somebody's risk is going to be. That formula is based on large epidemiologic studies. Some of these studies, like the Framingham study, have been going on for over 50 years, where patients have been looked at in the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. And these uh, risk factors have been documented. And then the families have been observed now for three generations to see how well these risk factors predict who's going to die of heart disease. And we can come up with fairly simple mathematical formulas that we can then apply to an individual patient. So let me show you an example. Here's a 61-year-old lady who feels fine but comes to see us for an assessment of their cardiovascular risk. 
Her blood pressure is measured in her right arm at 150 over 85. This is elevated slightly. It's called class 1 hypertension. Anything over 140 is elevated. 85 is normal, but she's got some high blood pressure. Her cholesterol is measured, and it's higher than average. It's 265. Her LDL cholesterol, that's the bad cholesterol, is also higher than it should be at 201. Her HDL, that's the good cholesterol, is lower than average. Average HDL for women is about 54. Hers is 34. And she's a diabetic, and she smokes a half a pack of cigarettes a day. So the question we want to ask is, with these factors, even though she feels fine, what is her risk of having heart disease? So we put all of these factors into an algorithm where we can assign points to each of the factors. The first one we look at is her age, and her age is 61, so she gets some points for being age uh, 61. Notice that as you get older, you get more points. Why do you get more points as you get older? Because as you get older, the prevalence of heart disease increases, so you're into the heart disease risk group. If she was very young, she would actually get negative points because the prevalence of heart disease at a young age is very low. Her total cholesterol was 260, so she gets an additional point for having a cholesterol higher than average. Her HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, was lower than average. She actually gets five points for having a low HDL. And this is because in women, HDL cholesterol is a better predictor of risk than total or LDL cholesterol. <laughs> women tend to have higher HDL cholesterols on average. Hers was very low, so that increases her risk according to the epidemiologic studies. Here's her blood pressure. Her diastolic blood pressure was normal, but her systolic was 150. We always take the highest number of the two, so she gets two points for that. Um, she is a diabetic, so she gets four points for that. She's a smoker, she gets two points for that. So here's all her points. 61-year-old with a high cholesterol, a low good cholesterol, a stage one blood pressure, diabetic, and smoking. She gets 22 points. And unfortunately, she's actually off our scale, because our scale only goes up to 17 points. But uh, at 17 points, her 10-year risk of having a heart attack is 27%. At 22 points, her risk of having a heart attack is 1 in 3. So she has about a 1 in 3 chance over the next 10 years of having a heart attack. Well, if someone came up to you and said, I know, I can predict your future. In the next 10 years, you have a 1 out of 3 chance of having a heart attack. Do you think you'd change something in your life to change that number? Certainly, I think that's a big motivation for doing some change. And the thing is, we can do that. Here's our patient who has this one out of three chance of uh, having a heart attack. Well, what if we took her blood pressure and instead of 150 over 85, we made it 130 over 85? That's easy to do. Give her a little bit of blood pressure medicine, we can lower her blood pressure. Her total cholesterol is 265. What if we make it down to 210? That's not that hard to do. That's the average cholesterol in the country. We can do that. HDL is 34. What if she, her, what if she had the average HDL for women at 52? She's still diabetic, we can't change that. She's still smoking, let's say we don't change that. So we've only changed and made her numbers average. We have reduced her risk from one out of three to about one out of five. Now let's make these numbers ideal. Let's take her blood pressure down a little bit normal and make it ideal, less than 120 over 80. Let's bring her uh, cholesterol even lower than average down to the 160 to 199 range. Inch up her HDL a little bit more to slightly higher than average. Let's cure her diabetes and stop her from smoking cigarettes we're now down to a 4% risk. So a 1 out of 3% uh, chance of having a heart attack to a uh, less than 1 out of 20 chance of having a heart attack, a 4% a chance in 10 years. We can get very close to this. We can get close to these numbers. This is kind of an ideal um, way of showing it to you. But we can show with aggressive identification of risk factors, targeting all of those risk factors, getting them as close to ideal as possible, we can bring about an 80-85% reduction in somebody's risk. And we can show the benefits sometimes within days of starting treatment that we can show risk reduction. And some of our highest risk patients who come into the hospital with heart attacks, starting therapies, we can show mortality benefits within 30 days. So these therapies are powerful therapies that can improve uh, risk uh, very quickly.